review of yesterday. Uh, I started out and said, hey, we're going to talk about materials, uh, but we're going to really talk about metals, and why aren't we talking about polymers, why aren't we talking about ceramics? Why aren't we talking about ceramics as structural materials? Uh, the fracture uh, size will fall is very small, which means they're brittle in layman's terminology, right? Uh, so ceramics are brittle, um, very useful for many things, um, higher melting temperatures than metals in, in general. Polymers, why don't we use polymers as structural materials? They can't take the heat. They can't take the heat. We do use them as structural materials. Trash cans, you know, toys, all kinds of things. But really critical things that, okay, they, have, they can't take the temperatures. So metals have this thing for this property called ductility, and there's a whole bunch of metals, and I left, listed these metals for a particular reason. They're the ones that show up on this graph, which is in a handout that will show up on Stellar um, with an article I wrote called The Future of Metals. Turns out 95 pounds out of every 100 pounds of metal made in the world is steel, okay? And aluminum is less than 2%, copper is a little over 1%, zinc is 0.8%. Most of the zinc is used to coat the steel for corrosion protection because the second Achilles heel of steel, aside from the first, which I told you earlier, steel is heavy, is steel is not very corrosion resistant. So you have to use lots of zinc. Millions of tons of zinc go to protect the hundreds of millions of tons of steel that are going to corrode. Lead uh, is a byproduct of zinc and copper, um, but we have a lot of uses for lead uh, in lead acid batteries, um, but it's now environmentally unsound. The roof of Kresge Auditorium is lead. Okay? Lead has tremendous atmospheric corrosion resistance. The first water pipes in England were lead because it's easy to form, okay? But now we don't even allow it to be in the solder of our joints and our plumbing. But we used to make our plumbing out of lead, okay? Nickel uh, is expensive, but it's critical, and we use it in places where steel just can't take the temperature or the oxidation resistance. And then you have the tape. <coughs> Other common materials, magnesium, titanium, uh, and tin. Most of the magnesium goes into alloying with aluminum, okay? But, uh, and actually there's a, yeah, I guess the other one, manganese, we'll talk about later, but it's not on here. But anyway, so I put those across here. There's lots of different types of metals, and which ones, if we take iron or any one of these, I could have drawn a line down here. <coughs> you have strength, ductility, toughness, and cost. These are properties of a particular metal. Those are mechanical properties in particular, except cost, which is an economic property. And steel has, if you remember the plot, uh, the Ashley strength toughness plot, steel's right out there at the top, along with cobalt alloys and copper and, and nickel, okay? But all those others have much higher cost. The closest one to uh, steel is copper, which costs about eight to ten times as much. Okay, so steel has low cost plus good strength, that and toughness. That's why it's. Uh, it, but it also has, in terms of processing, we can fabricate steel lots of different ways and relatively easily compared to a lot of metals. Recyclability: steel is easy to recycle relative to a lot of other materials. Availability is one of the most abundant elements of the Earth's crust. Not as abundant as aluminum, but, and there's a bunch of other properties you could list here. And these are, we have uh, the performance properties, corrosion, steel's not so great. Wear, fracture, fatigue, steel is actually pretty good in fracture and fatigue. Uh, wear has to do with hardness of material, we'll talk about that. Some people define material science and engineering as processing structure properties and performance, okay? So here are three of the four things that define material science and for structural materials. Uh, iron actually just rises to the top and not by a small percentage. It's 95% of all metals made. Um, and so my other, my overall two-line summary of yesterday, maybe this isn't the point you got, but 
we use metals for structures because of pressure resistance. Just like the back said. Spec, spec. Shock. Shock, shock. Yes, I got to make SH rather than SJ. That's right. Okay, shock. Okay. Uh, we use steel the most because of the combination of strength, cost, availability, recyclability, and everything else. Which is another important point. Materials are not chosen because of a single property. Okay? It's actually a suite of properties. And one of the biggest fallacies in the area of people overselling materials is that they say, oh, I just got the lightest material in the world. Mm -hmm. The lightest material in the world is an aerogel. Anyone ever heard of aerogel before? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what's an aerogel? Uh, it's um, silicon maybe, but it, it's basically it's air in a very small amount of holding or support material that really holds the air. Yeah, it's a, it's a silicon oxygen bond. It's actually made in a uh, we call a sol gel process, and it's a cellular material. If you go look right at the end of the infinite corridor, as you turn down, you go to building 16, there's a little display case across from Professor Gibson's office. She's the world's expert in cellular materials, and she's got a display case there, and she's got this little cube of air gel. You have to protect it from the atmosphere because the moisture in the air will dissolve it. It's sort of like lightweight jello without the water. Okay, it's you know, jello is just protein cellular structure with water in between and a little food coloring and flavor. Uh, not much more to jello, but anyway. Um, so, an aerogel is the lightest material, it has about 10% of the density of water, or even less in some cases. The thing is, if you blow on it, it will collapse. So, it's not exactly a structural material, but they, hey, it's the lightest in the world. And because people found something that was lightweight, when the folks at, I think, Sandia ended up getting interested in the Sandia National Labs in New Mexico, people started spending millions of dollars on aerogels as if they had an application for it, okay? And today, 25 years later, they still don't have an application for it. It's just a unique material. So why not go spend millions of dollars doing research on something that you know is useless? does have good insulation properties as long as you're working in the Atacama Desert in Chile, okay, where there's no moisture in the air, okay, or maybe up in space, except it's probably degraded by radiation up in space. I mean, you know, yes, okay, you can think of, okay, you can find of, that's what people, Jim no Williams, uh, Jim Williams at, uh, who used to be uh, the dean at, uh, retired dean at Ohio State, but, um, Jim was head of air, aircraft engines for, for uh, General Electric in Cincinnati, and he calls them boutique materials, okay? They have an application, or maybe even three applications, but they're not high volume materials, okay? And when you're talking about lots of things the Defense Department would like to have, we are talking about things you'd like to have in high volume. I said that, um, one of the Achilles heels of steel is, is uh, that it's heavy. To give you an idea, this is a piece of one inch steel made about 30 years ago. It's HY80. That well was made down in Groton, Connecticut in the lab. Uh, this is a piece of two inch thick titanium electro slag weld made at Oregon Graduate Center um, when, this is probably 35 years ago, when we were looking at trying to build a titanium submarine. Um, why have we not built a titanium submarine? Because it's really difficult to build titanium together. It is difficult, but the Soviets did it. It's expensive. It's expensive. Right. Okay. The Soviets you buy paint. Kill most of it for Pardon? Don't, Don't they also the uh, isn't the main source of titanium still in Russia, like manufacturing? Uh, no. Turns out titanium is all over the world. Okay. It's like aluminum is like fifth most abundant in the Earth's crust, and titanium is in the top ten. Okay. It's not in the top five, but it's. But it's not there. Well, we use lots of titanium dioxide. All the room, all the paint in this room has got titanium dioxide. When they got the lead out of paint, they put titanium dioxide in. But it takes a lot of energy to refine titanium to metallic state. It also doesn't have very good fracture toughness compared to steel. Okay, uh, it's okay, but it is lightweight. And they never could have built the SR-71 Blackbird. Right. 
the black version of spikeling. They had titanium skin because at the when you're flying at 100,000 feet at Mach 3 or whatever this thing flies at, the skin temperature is above the temperature at which aluminum will maintain its strength. In fact, the Concorde, the supersonic jet Concorde, didn't fly on speed, it fly, flew on skin temperature. On a colder day, to fly faster across the Atlantic. I took the Concorde once, I paid the extra $3,000, super first class ticket, just said, had flown it. This was 20 years ago. And I flew it. Filthiest plane I'd ever been on. They didn't have any extra aircraft, so they didn't have to maintain it very well. Okay. <laughs> Small seats, everybody was in super first class. Everybody went on board at once. It's a, it's a long story, but um, we actually, it was a good decision not to, in the United States, not to build a commercial SST. There are, so steel is relatively inexpensive, used in large quantities. This is a piece of the X 33 space plane, liquid hydrogen tank. Carbon carbon composite, no mix, honeycomb. Uh, it's a long story, but that material costs $12,000 a pound. It's light though, right? But it's only $12,000 a pound. Mm -hmm. And as fabricated, a titanium submarine is only about 100 times the cost of a HY-100 submarine. And what are you paying for the hull in an HY-100 submarine right now? It's only $25 or $30 a pound. So you want to start paying $3,000 a pound for a titanium sub? You can do it. But there were other reasons. Why did the Soviets mothball or basically dock all their titanium subs after three years? Didn't have anybody, no, they, they had funny money. It was all funny money. No, because they had cracks. One of the problems they had, uh, they were worried about, was that Soviet subs, and I was involved in this. My first research project at MIT in 1977 was from the Office of Naval Research the well of heavy section titanium. And so I remember coming back from Europe in 1980 on, in a, reading on the airplane in the International Herald Tribune about the titanium sub, the, the alpha sub. And then I got involved in a number of things down at David Taylor because the Congress was really upset. And this is sort of like Sputnik, the Soviets had leapfrogged us again, right, in technology. And at the time they were concerned because the, the Alpha sub could go faster underwater than our destroyers could go on the surface. Okay, so we couldn't chase them with ships. Had to chase them with aircraft if you had the range. And then the other thing is they could dive deeper than the collapse depth, collapse depth of the depth charges. Well, you can always design a deeper depth charge if you need to. Okay. Um, but people thought we'd never be able to, to track them. Well, it turns out they develop cracks. There's something called the creep fatigue interaction. I remember a guy from the Naval Research Laboratory at one of these conferences in the early 80s. Tom, how do they solve the creep fatigue interaction? I said, I don't know. Okay. Well, it turns out they didn't. <laughs> okay. The Naval Research Laboratory had done all kinds of studies on this, and it was one of the reasons why they couldn't recommend, even if you had the money, to go build a titanium submarine. But that's the difference between a political decision in the former Soviet Union. They wanted to leapfrog, even if, you know, no one is going to tell the, the top brass that even if we build it, we're going to have to dock it three years later because it's full of cracks. Okay, but that's why they could, could use them. Okay, they were full of cracks. Uh, and what had nothing to do with economics, they had an economic system that could never justify what they did. Okay? There are lots of um, joining technologies for other things. This is a piece of friction stir welded aluminum. Uh, a student gave it to me once. He worked for NASA. And this is how they put together part of the space shuttle main tank, which they no longer build, but nonetheless, distortion-free, relatively distortion-free, uh, friction stir weld. Boeing went out and spent $10 million to build a friction stir welding machine for some of their, for their structures, because a welded joint is always lighter than a bolted or a riveted joint. Think about it. Riveted or bolted joint has got to be an overlap. That double layer adds weight. If you can butt weld, okay, you always have a lighter structure. If you can't, okay, you can't always do it. But we're supposed to talk about welding and welding metallurgy. 
There's other technologies that are around today. You hear about additive manufacturing. This is something that I did uh, 20 years ago, or one of my students did for a thesis. When peace broke out in the early 90s with the former Soviet Union, and I apologize to those of you that are not U.S. Navy here, but during the Star Wars build-up in the mid-80s, there was lots of money for lots of things. And the U.S. Navy at uh, White Oak, Maryland, was developing, spent a quarter billion dollars developing particle beam weapons. Okay? Now this was to be a relativistic electron beam of millions of electron volts that if there was a, a cruise missile or an Exocet missile coming in to attack the ship, you got to remember this was not too many years after uh, the Falkland Islands War, uh, where an ex French Exocet missile hit the British carrier Sheffield, or not carrier, a cruiser Sheffield, and destroyed the ship with one, one small little Exocet missile. And the reason it destroyed the ship had nothing to do with the explosive charge of the Exocet or setting off charges it was the fact they had an aluminum superstructure. And the aluminum superstructure caught fire. Okay? And you can't put out a metal fire very easily. And they just burn the whole thing. And you might say, oh, those silly British. Well, it turns out before that, the original JFK was on maneuvers, this is the carrier, and the destroyer Belknap ran into it. Anyone ever heard about the Belknap disaster? Belknap pole. Pardon? They had like the Belknap pole now on the carrier so that you can see the aspect change of it. This is oh, this okay. random little pole just for, you know, seeing when the carrier is actually oh, okay. Uh, oriented. Okay, so well, anyway, the, the destroyer Belknap uh, ran, a, ran into the JFK on maneuvers and it was right underneath one of the aircraft elevators and some jet fuel got on top of the Belknap, ignited the superstructure, wiped out the Belknap. And the joke at the time was the gallon of jet fuel would wipe out any ship of the fleet. And I was around at David Taylor in the 1980s when they were trying to go from aluminum superstructures to a waffle steel construction for some superstructures. Your superstructures got to be lightweight. And the problem with steel is it's heavy and it corrodes. And I've been looking for my aluminum steel transition joint we may talk about later. Well, actually, it should be in some of my videos on, on explosive bonding and stuff. Uh, but the Navy uses a, a steel aluminum transition joint. So all this stuff is part of the, this is just still sort of an introduction of why we get to study um, uh, welding metallurgy. Uh, I told you that you have to study it because now she says so, and that's, that's all you need, right? It's all the explanation you need, okay? Um, but in fact, it's supposed to be welding metallurgy and I'm going to give you a little political perspective on the whole academic field. These are the books I took off my shelf on welding metallurgy. Okay? This is the oldest. Actually, it's fourth edition. It's 1983. But the original edition was the 1940s. Weldability of Steels by Stout and Doty. I just saw the uh, welding journal. Doty passed away at the age of 93 or whatever. Bob Stout was dean of the graduate school at High University when I worked at Bethlehem Steel. Um, but they wrote a book on weldability of steels because it uh, turns out uh, John Gross was director of research at U.S. Steel and he had been a faculty member at Lehigh. And uh, uh, John Gross at U.S. Steel used to call aluminum the near metal because aluminum doesn't have the same fracture toughness and things like that as steels. Um, this is the next two volume set. George Leonard was, George was, he's passed away a long time, but this is from the 1960s. Two volume set in welding metallurgy. Guess how many volumes, uh, or two, two volume sets, this has sold since the 1960s. As of 10 years ago, 400,000 copies. Okay, hey, you want to make some money? Write a book on welding metallurgy. <laughs> Not very many books get uh, that type of coverage. This is the latest one, 2015, John Lippold, who's a professor at Ohio State. Um, I'm old enough, I remember John as a graduate student. Um, and almost any book will have, if I just passed it, uh, if I passed it but didn't 
will have a book of the USS Schenectady. show you in the most recent book is connected at dry docks. Almost any book on steel fracture will have a picture of the Schenectady. No, I can't find it. But I'll give I'll show you where it came from. This is a 15 July 1946 report on a, of an investigation on the design and methods of construction of welded steel merchant vessels. And the Schenectady, an anchor, here's the Schenectady at anchor. That picture, anyone ever seen that picture before? Yes. Yeah, real quick. Riddle fracture. <laughs> Turns out this is the um, final report of the Board of Investigation convened by order of the Secretary of the Navy. Oops, what happened? Yeah, it's Turned it off. Did I lose the cable? No, I'll probably hit one of these buttons. Computer, light, camera, action. Now, well, one way to fix this. Report of a board of investigation. We've gone from the MIT libraries. One of my graduate students was over at Kresge Oval when they were having an MIT uh, library book sale, the books that were going to get rid of. He bought this for two bucks and gave it to me. It's sort of one of my prized possessions. But it is the final report. It was in the MIT libraries from 1947 until just a few years ago. Uh, and now it's on my shelf. Uh, but during the war, Anyway, out of about 6,000 ships, the number that had serious structural problems was huge. I apologize, I think I find out a little bit later. But uh, like 1,000, 1,100 ships had major structural failures. Six or seven broke up completely in two. There's the picture of the Schenectady, but there's also the picture of the SO Manhattan, which is right here. This happened not at dry dock, but out in the middle of the ocean. Not a good day, okay? And you probably don't have drills to handle that. Okay. Uh, what you do? Well, in any case, actually a number of them got cut Anyway, I'm not going to go through all these books, but I guess the reason I brought these is because there is no single course on welding that work. NAFC, this is sort of like my little questions about what's a meter, which is the longer a meter and stuff. They say you're supposed to have a course on welding metal but they don't tell you what's supposed to be in the course. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, of all these books, there are about half a dozen different ways to think of welding metallurgy. For example, John Lippold, very knowledgeable guy, received more awards from the American Welding Society than any person alive or dead. And uh, basically, well, actually, I'll show you. I actually have some of this stuff. I copied part of this. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. But um, if I can find it. Anyway, John has a list of which I can't find, um, the problems of weldability of steels. Or weldability in general. 
And the interesting thing to me, when I looked at this just last week for the first time, because the book is a brand new book, was to look at the topics. And the topics are the topics. Okay, so he's got fabrication related topics, and he's got some other topics over here, which he calls service related defects. The fabrication related defects are hot cracking, warm cracking, cold cracking, hey, what a great division, right? <coughs> Process control and others. And he, he goes through, the book goes through these things in some detail. Um, but, you know, I've been doing this stuff for 40 years and looking at failures. And most of these, I have never seen a real service failure. Now, it turns out when we were developing, when John Stasis, his advisor at RPI, Doc Savage was coming up in the 1950s and 1960s, and we were developing all kinds of new alloys for jet engines. A lot of these types of cracking were very prevalent 50, 60 years ago. But they're not prevalent today. Doc solved the problem. Just steel. Pardon me? No, no, you don't just pick steel. But you, you choose the compositions proper mode, okay? But people were developing new nickel-based alloys and, and new steels and, and things, and then they went to try to weld them, and they found they would crack when you weld them. I mean, it's true of aluminum 2024 alloy. It's been around since the 1920s. This aluminum copper alloy, you can weld it, make a beautiful weld. It's just it melts some heat effectors on it as you do it. So you have beautiful cracks. In fact, I developed a lab course 30 years ago around here uh, for the undergraduates, and they would go and weld 2024 break it almost with their hands, okay, half-inch plate, and then go and look in a scanning electron microscope to see these beautiful dead right you know, structures. So when you say it's cracking when they're welding it, <clears throat> are you saying that they weld it, it cools, and it's cracking during the cooling process? That particular thing is called hot cracking. Heat effect, heat effect is on equation. Okay. It's like 2024. No one welds 2024. I mean, you go look at the manuals. It tells you, don't do it. Okay. The reason they tell you. So... Um, I actually have seen 2024 heat effect zone equation once in 40 years out of thousands of failures that I've looked at. I've only seen it once. So what they're saying, what they're saying here is that as they're fusing it, like the crystal and structure of the metal sinking up has defects in it and oh, it, while okay. it's being welded. Now the way to think about it is most of the aluminum alloys, you now get learn about phase diagrams. You have temperature and you have composition. In this case, I'm going to do percent copper. So this is 100% aluminum over on this axis. And I realize how many people have seen a phase diagram before? Probably not most of these. Two. It's been a while. Okay. Probably? It's been a while. Sir. Okay. It's okay. A phase diagram is just plotting temperature versus composition of a metallic alloy. I'm going to show you one for seal in a little bit. But for aluminum alloys, almost all of them have this kind of shape. Okay? This is liquid. This is solid aluminum, 661 centigrade. Okay? This is probably about 535 or so centigrade. I don't remember exactly. This is called the eutectic. It's the lowest melting alloy, and it's uh, about 4% copper. Okay? They put 4% copper in aluminum, it dissolves, it lowers the melting point by over 100 degrees centigrade. Okay? My 2024 alloy is somewhere over here, and it starts to solidify with something almost pure aluminum when it hits what we call the liquidus line. And in this region, I have liquid plus solid. Over here, I'll have liquid plus another solid. We might call this alpha, and we might call this solid beta, and they have different crystal structures and things like that, but this one is actually a, probably a aluminum 3 copper, okay, intermetallic. I don't remember, I gotta look at the base right here. But the problem is, it starts to solidify here, and it doesn't finish solidifying until here. Things solidify over a range of temperatures. You're familiar, if you've ever made homemade ice cream, with an old-fashioned crank hand crank, you use salt and water. I can use salt and ice. Both of them are solid at room temperature, but you put them together and the salt will melt the ice. That's what we do on the sidewalks in the winter, right? 
because when they alloy together, the salt plus the ice will form a low melting salt water, okay? Which melts below zero degrees. Same thing with aluminum and copper. Well, if you have something that melts over a long range of temperature, this is called the mushy zone. It's like a slurpee, okay? And if I now have the thermal contraction stresses as the whole thing is cooling down, that slurpee gets pulled apart. I end up with cracks. Because slurpees have no strength. They got a liquid structure in between. Does that answer the question? I mean, this is welding metal. Oh, I'm so a little confused. So that sounds like you just you just said that as it cools, it pulls apart and cracks. Right. And that's I thought that's what I was asking the first the very start of my question. You said that was a different kind of welding at the top of your list. It was unrelated to the one that you were. No. Yeah. Well, I said this is. I said most of these things that John is going to talk about in this book. Okay. It has a whole chapter on hot cracking. Okay, or well solidification cracking, and then one on heat effects of some cracking. But frankly, 80% of this book is about problems that we have known in the past okay. that we don't experience anymore because the aluminum companies don't make alloys and they don't advertise them as weldable unless they've already done the metallurgy so they don't run into this particular type of problem. And when we get to welding of aluminum alloys, I'll tell you how you avoid it, okay? The simple way to avoid it is you either come up with alloys that are sort of in that range that have a very narrow range of freezing, or you do them in a very narrow range right over here that have a very narrow range of freezing. You avoid all these regions with wide melting ranges. So I have now a practical question based on the graph features. So at Super Trip Newport News, they're welding, you know, steel for the hull or something like that, right? <laughs> And they have interface requirements. They have these chalk, or not chalk, but wax. They're yeah. like little wax yeah. pencils, yeah. right? Yeah. And they're gonna, they, they, they basically, the process is, hey, if, if you audit someone and find that they didn't use this wax, and then, then it's a, they call it's bad well, you gotta call the question of the well, etc. Right. So yeah. I'm, well, I'm wondering now that I see this, if the basis is, you know, the wax is for the benefit class, but wax is melted at different temperatures, right? So you put one wax on, it's supposed to melt, and you. You take a different color wax and you, and you slide over the area that you're, you're preheating, and it doesn't melt. So you know that your temperature is in a certain range, right? Yep. Is that range that vertical chalk strike that you've drawn there? Are you trying to minimize no. the slurry on either side so that different different problem? The okay. steels generally don't have. Heat, I don't know if any steel has heat effect as an equation because iron based alloys just don't have this. Uh, they, I have seen weld solidification cracking when you're trying to weld over a high phosphorus paint, okay? And the phosphorus can cause you solidification cracking. The problem they're talking about in Cooper News is hydrogen new surface cracking. And we're going to go over that in spades. Because this I see half a dozen times a year. Even though Stout and Doty wrote this book about how to avoid hydrogen induced cracking. But now, 70, 80 years later, we still see it. The Seawolf submarine that I talked about was hydrogen induced cracking. Okay? We're going to go over that because it's still a problem. People still don't follow the welding procedures and they still fall off the cliff with hydrogen induced cracking. My point is most of what's in this book on welding metallurgy, this is a compendium of what John Lippold has worked on for the last 40 years. But that doesn't mean it's the practical things that you really need to know. This is the science of all the different ways a weld can go wrong. But I'm not going to spend all that time on some of these things that you won't see. <laughs> I mean, they're here, and we know about them, but we've learned to fix some of these. It's the ones we still trip on every day that I'm going to spend most of the time on. Okay? So we find the, the most of the most problem we have is based on a, based on the process, not like the material selection themselves has been figured out. We figured out what materials yes. can weld, what are the materials, and what what regions which we need to have a, a transition material. It is the, pro, the actual welding process that is messed up that causes most of our defects. Now. Yes, it's the processing, if you will. If I went back to my little plot before, talked about properties. We know how to engineer the properties of the material. We spent billions of dollars doing that. The processing, which is out there in the shop, people still think they can take shortcuts. Okay? 
If you don't take the shortcuts, you'll probably be okay. If you start taking shortcuts, you're gonna fall off the cliff, and I'm gonna make lots of money. Okay? It's okay with me. Okay? But in fact, I can't teach you all the things that are in this book plus all those books. And so it's important for you to know that what I teach is sort of what I've seen for thousands of failure analyses over 40 years of my career. I'm going to emphasize what I consider to be the most practical as opposed to the most scientific. Okay? I mean, some of these things you can do great science on. Okay? It's not that we don't have some decent science on, on hydrogen cracking, but it's, it's a different problem. Okay, so I mean, now having not a friend of mine, John Whipple's uh, book. Uh, now that it's a good book, it's a great book, I go and I refer to it. Okay, and I can talk about lateral tearing, okay, which was a problem in the 1970s when I worked at Bethlehem Steel. And I've got to go to Australia this summer, and there's a guy there who says, oh, this, this mill, this uh, crushing machine that was four stories tall in the Philippines that was where they were mining for gold, it was, uh, um, it, it was all because the, the steel had, was, uh, had lamellar tearing. Well, lamellar tearing is something that occurs in the base plate. You ever had baklava, the Greek phyllo dough, it's very layers and stuff? And you know how wherever they put the nuts, it just falls apart, okay? Well, that's lamellar tearing, okay? That occurs in the base belt. It doesn't occur in the weld belt. The problem is, these cracks occurred in the weld belt. Had nothing to do with the base metal. This guy wrote a report, 237 paragraphs. I read it, he wrote it in December, and I read it in January. In 108 paragraphs, he worked it with, mentioned the word laminations. Five sets of inspectors inspected the steel, no one found any laminations. But he writes a reply report, and he's still talking about laminations. Okay? That's sort of what's going on in a lot of these metallurgy books, they're still talking about problems that have been solved in the past. Okay? Now those problems still exist, but I'm, I don't have time to teach you all the problems. I mean, look at the, the height of the books, right? You're not going to come out of this being an expert in all of these different things, and I don't want to confuse you telling you about all these problems we used to have that we really have solved. You solve the problem of laminations and steel by producing good quality steel with low sulfur content and low inclusion content. And we make better steel today than we did in 1940 or 1950. And so, unless you get some sort of third world steel, where they're still making it like they made it in the 1930s, you won't run into laminations. I've never, have I ever seen, I'm not sure I've ever seen a real lateral there. Okay? Because, Okay, do I, I do want to talk a little bit about steel, but before I talk about steel, so I might as well try to follow some of that. Um, so we talked about brittle fracture, and here's a little graph that, a little graph, a big graph, uh, that I put together for, to explain brittle fracture and ductile fracture in metals. This is just a stress strain curve in green, okay, or under the green. And the, um, this is stress versus strain, or if you're a mechanical engineer or civil engineer, you talk about force versus stretch. And at two tenths of a percent offset, you'll have the yield point of, this, of the material, and this is, I have pictures of steel fractures here. This is inner granular fracture, very brittle fracture, no ductility, there are some steels that if you don't process them properly, will fail in an intergranular manner in a brittle, brittle manner. Are we looking at the face of the fracture surface? We're looking at a scan of the a fracture surface at high magnification. This okay. is probably 500x. This is, these are all probably 500x in a scanning like a microscope. And I've got better pictures than some of these. But in the red area, basically it's like stretching a rubber band. If you release the force, it comes right back to its original shape. Once you get above the yield point, that's where if you stretch it, it takes a permanent set. It doesn't come back to its original shape. It turns out brittle fracture occurs in the elastic range. We talked about elastic fracture. This is supposed to be brittle elastic, not 
twisting the knuckle classic and brittle elastic. Um, the uh, elastic fractures are brittle, like glass, and steel can be that way. There's a certain type of steel that we often, in high strength steel, we get cleavage fracture. That's three to five percent strain. That's enough stretch to avoid most catastrophic failures because you're still getting deformation of the steel before you break. Uh, here in the brittle range, you can get you can get breakage before you ever get to the, the yield strength of the steel. So a brittle fracture is unpredictable in terms of strength levels of the actual fracture. You have to get the fracture mechanics to explain it. Anyway, ductile is overload failure. Okay, and here are some better pictures, if you will, from a textbook. We have ductile failure, which is like a taffy pull. Okay, it's like pulling taffy. I meant to bring my uh, my silly putty, which I usually use. Um, but the meal, the metal deforms. You see the edges, and it forms these little taffy cut cones, uh, fractures. Cleavage fracture looks like this. There's a little bit of strain, and actually, it's not completely brittle. It is somewhat more brittle. It's more brittle than ductile. Um, and then there's completely brittle inner granular where you have less than 1% strain. Um, and so that's the difference in the fracture behavior. Um, I did want to say something also about how much we use uh, particular materials and structural materials. I should have had this earlier on. Um, we use about one and a half billion tons of steel in the world each year. The United States uses about 100 million of that, 100 million tons. But the world as a whole makes one and a half billion tons of steel. Actually, the United States uses about 10% of that, maybe 150 million tons. OK, aluminum is only 45 million tons. That's a small percentage, OK? And you go down here and you look at some of these other elements, and titanium is only 165,000 tons. Well, at 100 bucks a pound, of course, you're not buying as many tons. Okay? But nonmetals, these ceramic type materials, are actually the larger volume materials. We use about 6 billion tons of stone each year. Just take rock and crush it. Okay? Use it in cement as aggregate, use it to uh, fill up holes, you put it as railroad bedding okay, for the railroad tracks. We use lots of stone, okay? more than we do steel. Cement. It's currently at 2.2 billion tons, okay? I told you one of the advantages of steel is it's recyclable. At one and a half billion tons, we recycle over a billion tons of steel a year. And one time someone said, well, we're gonna run out of steel. And actually some guys bet on that about 50 years ago, and they built what they called mini mills, and they made a fortune by using 100% recycled steel. Because for 100 years, we've been putting about 50 million tons a year of steel into the environment, or 500 million tons of steel a year into the environment. And that stuff eventually comes back as scrap. And it turns out today, when, when I started working, when I worked at Bethlehem Steel, 70% of the steel came from virgin iron ore. 30% was from scrap. Today, over 50% is recycled material. Probably about 60% is recycled. Okay. Aluminum is not quite that far along in its recycling, but the more aluminum we use, the more it's going to go into the environment and the more it's going to come back. There's a tremendous volume of steel out there ready to be scrapped. If we ever had a steel shortage, it will come back not at $120 a ton, but at $150 a ton. We just raise the price just a little bit, there's going to be lots of more supply of recycled product. Stone, yeah, we recycle it. We make big stones, smaller stones, and use it in different ways. One of the problems with cement, how do you recycle cement? You break it apart. You break it apart into stone. It takes <laughs> okay. a lot of energy to do that. It takes a lot of energy. And one of the problems is stone and cement, if you take my material selection course, which you're not allowed to do unless you took another version of this course in the fall or something, I talk about these things. That's where this plot came from, okay? And it talks about the cost of the materials and the usage. And it turns out, the less the, less the material costs, the more it gets used. Well, duh, okay? But you know, most material scientists don't know that. They don't understand that concept. 
Okay. Um, believe it or not, they don't. Um, so why don't we go ahead and take a break? <coughs> we'll figure out how we're going to talk about the next. Um,